Welcome, everyone, to a very special Friday the 13th episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I am your host, the incredible Josh, and today we're going to be going over the iconic horror franchise, Friday the 13th, on the one and only day that we get a Friday the 13th in the year 2022. And I wanted to make it a special day over at the cabin. And funny story, this is actually the second time that I'm recording this episode. (laughs) I had this episode recorded. I was ready to go. I had this recorded about two days ago and I was going in to edit it today and found out that my audio file was corrupted. Yay, you gotta love technical difficulties. So I'm actually re-recording the episode now because I told everyone that I would do this. <laughs> of course, I wanted to do an awesome Friday the 13th episode. I really wanted to shine a light on the entire franchise and just talk about how it even made this day, like a Friday the 13th, an actual prominent day in society and in pop culture. The number 13 has always been unlucky. It's always been an unlucky number. But to associate it with Friday specifically as a day, Friday the 13th, it all came down to this iconic franchise. So, of course, I wanted to talk about it. And I wasn't going to let some technical difficulties get in the way. So I'm going to re-record the episode. And we're going to have a great freaking time. So what we're going to be talking about in this very special episode is the story behind each entry in the franchise, how Friday the 13th came to be, what made it become the iconic slasher franchise it is today, and then we're going to go into a full-on review of the first Friday the 13th movie from 1980. So let's start off by talking about the franchise itself. It's a series that consists of 12 slasher films, a television series, novels, comic books, video games, and just so much more between merchandise and pop culture. Jason Voorhees is absolutely everywhere. And with the exception of the first entry in the franchise, the story mainly focuses on the iconic killer Jason Voorhees, who is believed to have drowned at Camp Crystal Lake when he was a kid. His death was a result of a negligent camp counselor having sex while they should have been watching poor Jason. Decades after the death of Jason, Camp Crystal Lake is considered to be cursed. Local residents call it Camp Blood, and we get the fan favorite character Ralph dropping the infamous line, it's got a death curse! I absolutely love that scene. That's one of my favorite scenes in the entire franchise because I love Ralph. I am an absolute mark for Ralph. Like, he is just everything. It's sad that he wasn't able to be in more films and that he he wasn't able to have more appearances in the first two because I just, I absolutely love that character. And even though the killer in the first Friday the 13th movie wasn't Jason, he was still the motivation behind the murders as it was his mother who was conducting the slaying based on the fact that these camp counselors had been negligent and her son had died so she wanted to take revenge. Oh, sorry, spoiler alert. (laughs) If you haven't seen Friday the 13th yet, you should probably turn off this podcast and go watch it so that you don't get you don't get spoilers. I probably should have warned you that ahead of time, and I'm sorry that I didn't. The series itself, after many entries in the franchise were released, it went on to expand into the homes of audiences through their television set. Eventually, we got Friday the 13th, the series, which was released after Jason Lives, but it wasn't connected in any way to the Friday the 13th franchise. There wasn't Jason and Voorhees, there was no returning characters. Instead, the show focused on the idea of bad luck and curses, which it was symbolized in some entries in the Friday the 13th franchise, but fans didn't go to see a Friday the 13th movie for bad luck and curses. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they went to see it for Jason Voorhees taking out his machete or whatever weapon he has in his arsenal to slaughter and brutally murder people. That's why people watch Friday the 13th, not because of bad luck and curses. That's just a bad idea to begin with. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the production behind the movies in the franchise. But before we do, we're going to head over to Instagram and check out what some of my followers have to say about the Friday the 13th franchise. So I recently asked my Instagram followers in five words or less to describe the Friday the 13th franchise and we got some great comments here from my Instagram followers the first one comes from G underscore D underscore P underscore junior who says it's used and abused I couldn't agree more the franchise especially in the 80s and 90s just went in a weird direction like you could tell they were just using Jason Voorhees as some kind of tool to become a money-making machine, a revenue-generating box office hit, because the stories themselves were absolutely ridiculous. And you'll see that later on as the story continues and as the franchise moves on, just exactly how ridiculous it gets. And they just used and abused the Voorhees character and everything that we loved about him to 
exploit him basically they exploited the character for money and they continue to do so through merchandising they can't do any other movies because of legality issues which we're going to get into later on in this episode but they need to give us a jason Voorhees that is done right that is just does justice for the character overall instead of giving us a crappy story like him versus carrie or some sort of paranormal voodoo fetus creature looking thing that possesses people Ugh, we'll get into those later in this episode and exactly what I think about them. The next comment on Instagram comes from Horrorween underscore Kev, one of my favorite people on Instagram, says, totally awesome, and then gives the devil horns. It is. It's one of the greatest franchises in the horror genre. And even if you're not a horror fan, you know Friday the 13th. You know Jason Voorhees. You, unless you're living under a rock, <laughs> you know how iconic this franchise and Jason Voorhees himself is. Next comment comes from Issa underscore Cupcake Mina, who says, iconic theme, huge ass machete. <laughs> I love that. And it was really the spawn of Halloween 1978 that gave us horror movie killers with theme songs, <laughs> right? We got the iconic theme in Halloween, and that's really what spawned the iconic theme that we got in Jason, or sorry, in Friday the 13th. There was a lot of inspiration that the filmmakers and the writers took from Halloween 1978, because really that was the inspiration to even start Friday the 13th, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But that iconic theme that you hear in Jason really was because we got an iconic theme in Halloween. And that huge ass machete that Jason carries around... <laughs> I just absolutely love the fact that they gave him a machete because it's one of the most brutal blades that there is and it just causes so much carnage <laughs> whenever he swings it. I, I love the fact that Jason Voorhees wields a machete as his weapon. The next comment comes from Vampira Sky underscore Wolfmood who says 80s horror is the best. Absolutely it is. And it's because of the horror movies that we got in the 70s, you know, like Black Christmas, Last House on the Left, Halloween 1978. It's because of those movies that we were able to really have what we had in the 80s. Those were the stepping stones for the movies that we come that we've come to love today. Like Friday the 13th would never have been made if Halloween wasn't, and Halloween never would have been made if Black Christmas wasn't. Like there's just so many movies that take inspiration from each other while still heading in a new direction and giving us a new a new take on the slasher genre. It's just 80s horror was the best time for that. Another one of my favorite people on Instagram, n.o.w.l.91, says it's a mama's boy slaughter fest. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> who is, outside of Norman Bates, who is the biggest mama boy in the horror genre? It's, it's Norman Bates and Jason Voorhees. Like, there's, there's no bigger mama's boy than those two, <laughs> right? They kill for their mother. Like, And then we've got another one from Pretty Killer Podcast, who I absolutely adore. And I'm actually trying to get onto one of our future episodes because I want to do a whole review of the Scream franchise. And I think that she would be an awesome person to have on because she has some very heated opinions for the fourth and fifth entry, which I know many fans of the franchise love kind of and adore it's kind of a love-hate relationship with those two so i want to get her on and i want to hear her thoughts so i'm really hoping we can make that happen but about the friday the 13th franchise she says legendary but not the best i agree it is definitely a legendary franchise it's not the best franchise i will still stand behind that halloween is the best franchise i stand behind that and i will die on this hill saying that halloween is the best horror movie franchise period i love saw that's the only one that comes real close to me for the best horror movie franchise i love saw but in terms of consistency and just innovation and how much it spawned creativity in the horror genre Halloween will still remain as my number one favorite franchise. All right, so let's head back into Friday the 13th, talk a little bit about the production that happened behind the scenes of the franchise. So like I was saying, the first entry of the series was developed in response to the success of Halloween 1978. The filmmakers wanted to cash in on the audience's love for brutal slayings and silent killers. So it was at that point that Sean S. Cunningham, who had come off the heels of working with Wes Craven on Last House on the Left, set out on a marketing campaign for the Friday the 13th movie. The campaign was released and a script wasn't even developed yet. <laughs> they literally just wanted to gauge whether anybody actually would see a movie with this kind of premise, which at the time there really wasn't a premise. It just, it was a horror movie about Friday the 13th. That's all you really got from the poster. You didn't know if there was going to be anything worth seeing. The concept of the first entry in the franchise was under the working title of A Long Night at Camp Blood, which explains where the Camp Blood moniker comes from with local residents in town calling Camp Crystal Lake Camp Blood. So that was while the script was being drafted. 
And it was at that point that the advertising campaign kicked off and Cunningham really wanted to use the Friday the 13th moniker. So he, when he put it out in the advertisement, it was really because he wanted to see if anybody had owned the rights to the title. He wanted to avoid any potential lawsuits from the movie and felt it would be best to just put it out right away if there's going to be any copyright infringements and just get that out of the get that out of the way before the movie releases. And once the advertisement was released, there was a small hiccup from distributor George Mansour, who claimed to have a movie released prior called Friday the 13th, The Orphan. Now, this movie was moderately successful, so threats of legal proceedings did occur, but nothing really came of it. It's unclear whether a settlement was made or if someone was paid off behind closed doors, but the issue was eventually resolved. And then it went on, got released at the box office, and despite it being considered a slasher flick, which was relatively not released to wide audiences during that time, right? Like Halloween, when it was released, it was a lot of word of mouth that really pushed theaters to get that movie in their city or their town. It wasn't wildly distributed like many blockbuster films were. And when Friday the 13th hit the box office, it raked in $59.75 million worldwide. And it was that success that led Paramount to put plans into motion for a sequel and then acquire the worldwide distribution rights for the franchise because they just saw dollar signs at this point. It costs peanuts to make and they make close to $60 million across the world off this movie. Of course they're going to buy the rights to it and make more, right? People are going to pay to see it. The thing is, though, the filmmakers really intended the first movie to be a one and done kind of film. They, they really didn't leave any doors open for a sequel in the franchise. Like, yeah, there was the dream sequence at the end of the first movie but that was just a dream and producers made it just because and it was really in the movie just as a joke at the end of the day they they didn't expect the the movie to spawn any sequels or a franchise like it is today so paramount went to the drawing board they started working on ideas for a sequel and one of them was to have a series of films that were discontinuous so that means there wouldn't be any continuity between the films in the franchise each one of them would re- would be released with a unique concept and they'd be a separate scary movie from the rest and they would be doing this once a year and it wasn't until Phil Scaduri, who's the co-owner of Esquire Theatres and also a producer of the first Friday the 13th film, insisted that the sequel must include Jason Voorhees. And even when we see Jason Voorhees jump out of the lake at the end of the first Friday the 13th movie and it's a dream sequence, Steve Miner, the associate producer of the first film, really believed in having Jason Voorhees return for the sequels. So he directed the next two installments himself. And they became financial successes really because of the low budget it took to produce and the amount of money that made at the box office and home video (laughs) and audiences continued to go see every entry in the franchise even though each film kind of repeated the same concept of jason just chasing teenagers and slaying them at camp crystal lake slight adjustments of course were made later in the franchise but in a very weird way (laughs) the the franchise went in a very weird direction which we're going to talk about in a little bit but before we get into that i want to talk about what's new over at the cabin of horrors we just completely revamped our website completely new design a whole bunch of new things for you to check out tons of new horror content to see and we also opened up our online shop artwork from yours truly is on display and you can purchase that on prints posters canvas wooden plaques metal plaques there's going to be tons of more merchandise to come so make sure you head on over to cabinofhorrors.com take a look at what's there and take a look at all the horror content we have there's tons of articles and news and lists for you to look at and read and really learn more about the horror genre and expand your horizons on what's out there in horror maybe there'll be even a friday the 13th poster released today But you got to go check out cabinofhorrors.com. And if you do, and you're going to purchase the Friday the 13th poster, make sure that you use the coupon code Friday the 13th to get 15% off of your order. And speaking of Jason, there actually came a point where they decided to kill him off for good in the franchise. It was because of the producer Frank Moncasso Jr. being typecasted in the industry as a horror director. So that made uh, finding new films to produce outside of the genre difficult. So in the final chapter, Voorhees was killed off for good, but we know he wasn't going to stay buried for very long, <laughs> right? There's tons of times in this in this review and in this podcast episode that I'm going to mention he just doesn't die. <laughs> Jason is very much like Michael. He's very much like Freddy. He's just never going to die. Now, I think it's time for us to head into the nitty gritty of things and talk about the movie that we're all here to talk about, and that's Friday the 13th. But before we do that, I'm going to head back to my Instagram and we're going to find out what some of my followers' favorite kills are in the franchise. So the first one comes from Nick Horrorfan88, who says his favorite kill in the franchise is in part six, which is the RV camper madness Nikki in court. 
epic kill. I actually forgot about that kill because there's so many iconic kills in the franchise. That one is definitely up there. The next one comes from the final girl next door underscore that says when he sliced Andy down the middle while he's doing a handstand in part three. That is definitely in my top three favorite kills in the franchise because it always reminds me of like a hipster getting his (laughs) getting his just desserts doing a handstand and get sliced right down the middle. And the practical effects on that was absolutely incredible. I'm pretty sure that was Savini. I'll have to double check. Don't quote me on that. But I'm pretty sure that effect was Savini as well. And one of my favorite people on Instagram gave his two cents, horror underscore collector 8586. Go check this guy out. Josh is amazing. I absolutely love his content. I love his account. He does horror lives all the time. Go check this guy out. He's definitely one of my favorite people on Instagram. His favorite kill of the franchise is from Freddy versus Jason when Trent was folded in bed. That was a great kill too, actually. I really enjoyed that one. A lot of kills from Freddy versus Jason are just underrated. A lot of people don't give that movie the credit it deserves. It had some epic fucking kills in it for how corny of a movie it was, really. All right, so we're all here for the same thing. We're all here to talk about Friday the 13th. So how about we dive into a full review of the first entry of the Friday the 13th movie from 1980. Hello? Who's that? Oh, hi. What are you doing out in this mess? One. So it's 1958, and we see some teenagers around a campfire enjoying their summer holiday at Camp Crystal Lake. There's two counselors, Barry Jackson and Claudette Hayes, who sneak inside a storage cabin to have a little fun. We all know they're going to have sex. And it's at this time that we see the first kill of the film. Though throughout the movie, we don't see the killer's face or body structure. We have no idea who the killer is. So they kill the two camp counselors, and then we fast forward 21 years when we see Annie Phillips being driven halfway to Camp Crystal Lake. The camp's being reopened after the tragic events that took place 21 years prior, even though locals are warning everyone, including Annie, off, saying the camp is cursed, calling it Camp Blood. She's also warned by Crazy Ralph that the camp has a death curse, and then she starts heading out towards the camp with a truck driver named Enos. 
So he's explaining to Annie on their trip the troubled past of the camp between the child drowning in the lake and camp counselors being brutally murdered. But this doesn't scare off Annie at all. (laughs) She continues heading towards Camp Crystal Lake. So she's dropped off close by by Enos. When another car comes by, she hitches a ride with them. But this driver remains anonymous to us. We have no idea who's driving the vehicle, which kind of gets our suspicions rising, right? So the drive begins to become dangerous. Annie jumps out of the vehicle and starts running through the woods. The driver heads out and starts chasing her as well. So Annie eventually finds a tree. She thinks she's safe. She's resting down by it. But then we see a machete come out from behind her and cut her throat. So we know this movie is definitely starting off intense. We know that it's going to be brutal. We know there's going to be some great kills. People are going to die, but we don't know who the killer is. And that's really what we want to know, right? That's what the the audience wants to fall into that mystery of who's the killer. That's why the Scream franchise does so well, right? Is because every movie, there's a different killer and you don't know who the killer is. So you're guessing it throughout. It's like that murder mystery aspect and audiences love that. So the movie then heads back to the camp where we see the camp counselors who are still alive. Uh, We've got Ned, Jack, Bill, Marcy, Brenda, and Alice, and then the owner, Steve Christie. And they're all working on refurbishing the cabins and facilities at Camp Crystal Lake to get it ready for the season. A thunderstorm approaches the camp, so Steve leaves to go stock up on supplies when Ned sees someone walk into a cabin and follows them. And then in typical horror movie fashion, Jack and Marcy head into one of the cabin bunk beds to have sex. (laughs) Because you can't have an 80s slasher movie or an 80s horror movie without teenagers having sex. It's just not a thing. So the camera pans to them having sex, then goes to the bed above them, and we see Ned's dead body with his throat cut. Marcy gets up, goes to use the bathroom. The other camp counselors are in the cabin having a fun game night. And when Marcy's away in the bathroom, Jack gets his throat pierced with an arrow underneath the bed in what's one of the most iconic kills, not only in the Friday the 13th franchise, but in horror period. I absolutely love that kill. And I watched a documentary about Friday the 13th and Savini talked about that specific effect and how he and I guess it was one of his assistants were underneath Kevin Bacon, pushing the blood through a tube because the their setup had actually broke during the filming of that and they only had one one chance to do that take so they're pushing the blood they're blowing through a tube to push the blood which is giving it that squirting effect and it's just it's so iconic it came even though it wasn't exactly how they wanted it to play out on film it still looked great and became my favorite kill in the friday the 13th franchise hands down so then after jack gets his throat pierced with an arrow we see the killer heading into the bathroom and slamming an axe into marcy's face at the same time brenda hears a voice calling for help so she heads towards the archery range steve comes back to camp after gathering supplies and runs into the killer and recognizes them but we don't get to see the killer yet at this point the killer then brutally stabs steve and he's dead so the, the rest of the camp counselors start to realize that their friends are just not around. <laughs> like, where is everybody? Did they go to fuck? Did they disappear? Where the fuck is everyone going? So they decide to head out and they start looking for where the fuck everybody is. Alice and Bill leave the cabin to investigate and try to find everybody. Uh, what they find is the axe in Brenda's bed. Notice that the phone lines have been cut and Ned's truck is broken down. So they begin to panic. Shit's a little bit weird at camp crystal lake right now the power across the camp also goes out so bill decides to check on the generator but he doesn't make it back right bill's dead alice goes to head out to find him and then sees his body pinned against the generator room door with arrows so it's at this point she knows that shit's going down shit's not right people are dying there's dead bodies everywhere so she flees the scene and heads toward the cabin to hide out and that's when she sees brenda's body thrown through the window And then as she's freaking out, she's trying to figure out what's going on. She sees headlights coming down from a vehicle towards the camp. So she rushes outside thinking it's probably Steve. However, it's an older lady who's actually a friend of Steve and his family, Pamela Voorhees. So Alice brings Mrs. Voorhees inside the house and tries to get some kind of help. She sees the bodies of the slayed teenagers and blood plastered across the floor and becomes absolutely distraught. And then she starts talking about the curse of Camp Crystal Lake explains the events that unfolded decades earlier and we find out it's actually her son jason who was the boy who drowned at the camp in 1957 
She spares no time blaming the death on camp counselors who are too busy having sex than to watch her baby boy. And throughout these tellings, we realize that the killer is Pamela Voorhees. So she starts chasing Alice and tries to kill her, but she gets away and ends up knocking Mrs. Voorhees unconscious, makes a break for the shore to try to escape, but Mrs. Voorhees comes back, attacks her, and this is when Alice takes the machete and decapitates Mrs. Voorhees. Killing her, right? Obvi- well, I shouldn't say obviously because we've seen decapitations in horror movies before. Halloween H2O! And they weren't dead. So I shouldn't say definitively dead, but Mrs. Voorhees did die in this attack. So after she kills Mrs. Voorhees, she ends up falling asleep inside a canoe that's floating in Camp Crystal Lake. Next morning, police show up and find Alice asleep in the canoe. And then that's when we get Jason's decomposing corpse jump out of the lake and attack her. However, it was just a dream sequence, right? Alice wakes up in a hospital bed and finds out that it was all a dream. At least the, the, the boy jumping out of the lake, not the events before it, but that part was just a dream. She asks about the little boy in the lake, though. She really thinks it's real. And the sergeant says, well, there was no boy in the lake. No bodies were found anywhere in the lake. That's what really left audiences believing, well, Jason Voorhees may still be buried deep in Camp Crystal Lake. And while that was a dream and while it was a joke from filmmakers, it did leave the door open a tiny bit. And that's what really gave us the iconic killer, Jason Voorhees, at the end of the day. They believed in the idea. They believed in the character. So they went with it and it worked out well for them because they were able to build an entire franchise off it. Speaking of the franchise, we haven't seen an entry in the Friday the 13th franchise in over a decade. It's been such a long time since we've been able to see the iconic Jason Voorhees slash and slay his way on the big screen. And really, it's odd considering Friday the 13th is one of the biggest horror movie franchises of all time. Like, yeah, we've gotten some pretty crappy entries, you know, with Jason X and Jason Goes to Hell and all that kind of stuff. But we've seen some really good reboots like Evil Dead, the new Halloween movies, Halloween Kills, right? Like those were great reboots and have shown much success for their franchises. The reason why we haven't gotten a new Friday the 13th movie is really because of the legal battle that's been surrounding the franchise. And on top of that, there's creative difficulties and obstacles that studios face, right? When trying to revitalize an iconic franchise like Friday the 13th, there's a lot that goes into it because horror fans are going to go in with specific expectations. They may be low, they may be high, depending on the fan, but they're going to go in there with expectations and they need to be met if there's going to be any success to come from that entry in the franchise. The legal dispute that's been surrounding the Friday the 13th franchise is with Sean Cunningham, who's the director of the first entry of the series, as well as the producer of several sequels. He's in a battle with Victor Cunningham, who was the writer of the first Friday the 13th movie. Initially, the court had ruled the rights in favor of Miller back in 2020, but Cunningham went and appealed it. So that went back to court, right? Still put the the franchise in limbo throughout that whole time. However, in December of last year, Miller has secured the rights to the Friday the 13th franchise. So he's got it. It's secured. There's no more real question about who owns the rights of the franchise, but we shouldn't expect any entries coming anytime soon, right? It's still going through the resolution phase that both parties have to come to some sort of resolution. So when that happens, hopefully we can start looking at new entries from the iconic Jason Voorhees. But at the same point, despite these legality issues that surround the franchise, making another entry in the series can really prove to be challenging, right? Like it has 12 entries and it provides a lot of opportunity for failure in the eyes of horror fans. It could also put the series at risk for overexposure, though many people may argue that considering we haven't gotten a movie in in the last decade, that it may not be overexposure. But if you look at what they did to him in the 80s, that worrisome feeling of overexposure is warranted, right? An entry in the Friday the 13th franchise came out almost every year, and each one was kind of a steep drop off compared to its predecessor. It just got weirder and weirder with each entry in the franchise. But it has been over a decade, so that can play well for the filmmakers in developing a new movie because society's come a long way since then. It's a much different time since we last saw Jason Voorhees, right? So there's a lot of new opportunities and places to take the character, which really could be exciting for horror fans. There's a lot of opportunities with a reboot, but it has to be done right. Making a new entry in the Friday the 13th franchise, right? Like it needs to be analyzed and thoroughly thought through. We've already seen a remake of Jason Voorhees' classic origin story in a modern setting, and it wasn't very good. The Friday the 13th reboot wasn't a very good movie. It was a mishmash of concepts from the first few movies that kind of worked, but didn't work together 
in a movie that already has lore that you're trying to retcon. Like it just, it didn't work very well. And horror fans aren't going to be excited to see that same concept again. So you really have to take into account that there's a new generation of audiences that are watching while at the same time, your old generation of audiences are still going to continue watching entries in the franchise. So you have to have that balance between appealing to both. Right? Like a reboot should definitely touch on his origin story so new audiences actually know how Jason came to be. But don't pull it, don't push it so far out that older audiences can't connect with it anymore. Right? You need those older audiences because they're the ones who are going to go to the new audiences and be like, hey, you need to check this out. This is one of the most iconic horror franchises in the genre. You need to watch this. It's those guys that are going to brag and get the new audiences to watch your movie. So you need to appeal to both sides. It's really important to keep that in mind when they're going to be doing a new entry in the franchise. Now, with it being Friday the 13th, and there's 12 entries of Jason Voorhees movies, we should definitely touch on at least each one of them a little bit. So that for those who don't know the story of the franchise can actually learn a little bit about it without having to watch every single movie, including the bad ones. You'd be surprised that a lot of people actually don't know the entire franchise story. Most people have seen the first movies, you know, maybe a couple of sequels after, probably seen Freddy vs. Jason, but not movies in between, right? A lot of people haven't watched the entire franchise start to finish, so they don't know the entire journey that Jason Voorhees has been on. So that's what we're going to be going over here on this episode of the podcast now. And since we've gone over and reviewed the entire first movie, (laughs) pretty sure you get the gist of that story. So we're going to start off with the first sequel in the franchise, which is Friday the 13th Part 2. And this starts off with continuing the story from the first film. So we actually get to see Alice. She's at her home suffering from PTSD due to the events that happened at Camp Crystal Lake. She strongly still believes that Jason did come out of the water and attacked her. And even though the police couldn't find any traces of a body in the water, she's still adamant that Jason came out and attacked her. So we fast forward two months. Alice is still haunted by the night she murdered Pamela Voorhees. And little does she know, Voorhees survived his drowning as a child and has actually been living in the woods ever since. Jason leaves the woods, starts going on the hunt for Alice, finds her, and ends up brutally murdering her by putting, I believe it was a screwdriver, into her temple. Which was a pretty cool kill, actually. I quite enjoyed that. But I don't feel like they really did Alice justice. You know, she was a final girl in the first movie. And then they kind of just killed her off and played her off like she was nobody in the sequel (laughs) like you can't do that to a final girl i'm sorry (laughs) as a horror fan i feel like you can't do that to a final girl like they did the same thing to laurie strode in halloween resurrection right they killed her off i think it was like 15 minutes into the movie in just an unceremonious fashion and it was the worst way to kill a character that not only was a final girl but an iconic entry in the franchise so i feel like they just did not do her kill any justice or her character for that matter So the movie pans over to Camp Crystal Lake, and we see that the legend of Jason Voorhees continues to live on, a campfire tale is being told by head counselor Paul, and he explains to his crew that Jason didn't drown in the lake, and he's been living in the woods ever since. It's at that point, Jason heads out on his murder rampage, he adds a hammer, spear, and a knife to his arsenal alongside his machete, and he starts stalking the camp counselors one by one. An awesome series of kills in typical Jason Voorhees fashion. The end of the movie, we see Ginny as the final girl. She finds his shrine, which is a shrine to his decapitated mother. The head of Pamela Voorhees is right front and center of this shrine, and her sweater's right underneath it. And Ginny takes the sweater and puts it on to save herself, because in Jason's mind, he sees a blonde-haired woman wearing this sweater. It must be mommy. I, I get the logic. I get the logic. Suspension of disbelief. I get the logic. So that, putting on the sweater saved her life. And then we end up seeing her, we're waking up in an ambulance, and there's no sign of Paul in sight. So we don't know if Paul's dead at all. And Ginny is just going off to the hospital now. But we believe Jason's continuing to live in the woods because we didn't see him fully die yet. And fun fact about Friday the 13th Part 2 that some people may not know unless they've seen it is that we actually don't get to see Jason's iconic hockey mask in this entry of the franchise. He's wearing a sackcloth as a mask. We actually don't get the hockey mask until the next entry in the franchise, Part 3. And that movie actually really gave us two big changes. Outside of the iconic hockey mask that we see Jason Voorhees wear today, they also changed the setting of the movie. It wasn't focused around a camp and counselors being slaughtered. Instead, the story surrounds Chris, who was attacked by a masked figure years earlier in the woods near Crystal Lake. So we kind of figure, (laughs) you know, we're not dumb. Horror audiences are not dumb. 
if you were stalked by a masked figure in the woods near Crystal Lake, we're pretty sure you were stalked by Jason Voorhees. Whether the movie says it right away or not, it's implied. We know you were stalked by Jason Voorhees. So Chris decides to go and confront her trauma head on and returns to Camp Crystal Lake where she was attacked with and heads there with a group of her friends. Now, these friends are a bunch of dicks. They're not the best people. <laughs> they actually go and mess with a bunch of bikers who then follow them to Chris's house and set fire to her barn. They're going to learn that was the worst mistake of their life <laughs> because in that barn is Jason who's resting and nursing his wounds from the events of part two. So he wakes up in this barn that's burning down and decides to go out on his murderous rampage to kill these fuckers. And it's at this point you got to feel bad for Jason Voorhees, right? Like the kid drowns in a lake because... Camp counselors were too busy having sex than to give a shit about him. So he decides to live his life, live his best life or his worst life, however you want to look at it, and go in the woods, raise himself, figure out how to live his own life. And then people come back to Camp Crystal Lake and start fucking with his shit. And he's like, what the fuck? So he... He then leaves Camp Crystal Lake and finds this barn so that he can heal up because these camp counselors fucking went at him. And then someone lights the barn on fire. The guy is just trying to live his fucking life and you guys can't leave well enough alone. Like you've really got to feel empathy for Jason Voorhees at this point. Because is he really a killer or is he just protecting himself and his land? <laughs> Think of it from that perspective. The next time you go watch Friday the 13th part two or part three, go into that perspective that Jason's not a killer and he's just protecting himself and his land. <laughs> kind of like Tucker and Dale versus evil. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to hell. So after Jason starts going on his murderous rampage, he has a final confrontation with Chris where we get the confirmation that Jason was the one who did stalk her all those years ago. Surprise. Oh no, we had no idea. <laughs> so she puts an axe in Jason's head and leaves him for dead. Though we all know Jason's not dead, even though audiences believed an axe in your head is going to be the final straw to, to anybody. Nope, we get the final chapter. <laughs> the fourth installment in the film comes out. But with, with a movie subtitled The Final Chapter, it really leads you to believe that, okay, well, this may be it. This may be the final movie. We can somehow get past the fact that an axe was in Jason's head. Okay, maybe this is the, the time that Jason's going to die. So the movie starts off with the assumed death of Voorhees, right? Because everyone assumes he's dead. He got an axe in his head. Well, he's taken to Higgins Have Morgue, revitalizes himself and escapes. This is where we're introduced to Tommy and his sister, Trish. They're also at Camp Crystal Lake visiting their summer home. Tommy's your typical quirky kid. He's obsessed with creatures and monsters, makes his own monster masks, and Jason's murderous rampage eventually brings his way over to Tommy and Trisha's house. This is where Tommy, who actually knows about the legend of Jason Voorhees, starts fighting back using everything he knows about it. And this is a smart thinking kid, okay? So he shaves his head, covers his face in white powder, and deepens his eyes with black makeup to try and remind Jason of his own childhood as a kid. He wants to try to appeal to the kid in Jason and remind him of himself at a young age. And that distracts Jason, which gives Tommy's sister Trish an opportunity to use Jason's machete against him. This is when Jason's face is revealed for the first time, and we realize that Trisha's attempt to kill Jason failed. That's when Tommy picks up the machete and begins attacking Jason brutally with it, just stabs him to death. And so we're pretty sure Jason's dead at this point. He's been hacked to bits. There's no way he's coming back. Jason Voorhees is dead. Then we get the fifth entry in the Friday the 13th franchise, which after the events of the fourth film follows Tommy Jarvis. So we get to see him five years later after the traumatic events he went through with in the final chapter. He's still suffering from PTSD. He's experiencing flashbacks. He's got anxiety all around. He's not doing too good. So he's at a mental health facility at Pinehurst Halfway House. And the staff are really trying to help Tommy get a better handle on his past. Well, that's not going to happen because on the first day he's at this facility, he sees an altercation between two patients where one of them's murdered with an axe. So this guy's trying to recover from a traumatically brutal slaying. And the first day there, he gets triggered by seeing a traumatically brutal slaying. Go figure. <laughs> So the movie heads on, we get to see more brutal slayings from a guy wearing a hockey mask who we believe is Jason Voorhees, but this hockey mask has a blue stripe instead of red. 
That's important to notice. Patients and employees also believe that it's Jason Voorhees because of Tommy, right? Tommy's troubled past. They think he's coming for Tommy, but it's revealed at the end that the killer's not Jason. How confusing, right? <laughs> the killer's actually a paramedic who was called to collect his own dead son, who ha- and he had a psychotic break and then took on the mantle of Jason Voorhees. He started going on a copycat killing spree because of Tommy's history. So... That really plays into the fact for audiences that Jason Voorhees is actually dead, right? Because in part five, Jason Voorhees isn't the killer. He's not the killer of Friday the 13th. And that also plays into what we talked about earlier, that the original idea for the Friday the 13th franchise was to have discontinuous films. Each one of them was going to be a different scary movie and not actually connect to the previous ones. So you got to wonder that if this was their attempt at bringing that idea to life in the Friday the 13th franchise, though it obviously wasn't received well by fans because they quickly realized that the iconic killer was not in part five, that they did not get Jason Voorhees. And some fans felt duped. (laughs) They felt like they got ripped off because they were led to believe throughout the whole movie that it is Jason Voorhees, that he is the killer. But at the end of the day, it wasn't. It was just some fucking guy that snapped. And I think that may have been exactly what happened because when part six came out, they actually subtitled it Jason Lives. So everybody knows, okay, this movie will actually have Jason Voorhees in it. I think that was kind of a big deal for horror fans at the time. I don't know because I wasn't real. I was like probably one or two at that time. But I guarantee the fact that they named it Jason Lives had a big part to play in that marketing strategy. Though in the sixth entry of the franchise, we get Tommy Jarvis again. He can't leave well enough alone. This guy this guy has been haunted by Voorhees his whole life and just can't leave it alone. So he goes back to Camp Crystal Lake and searches for Jason's body, digs it up, stabs a metal spike through Jason's corpse. Because I guess he doesn't think he's dead, right? The guy's buried under dirt. But I guess he's not dead, so let's stab him with a fucking stake, right? Or a metal spike. And then in one, of the, in one of the most corniest moments in horror, a bolt of lightning comes down and strikes the spike that's in Jason. And this is what reanimates him so he can continue stalking Tommy. So we learn in the movie that after the terrible reputation Camp Crystal Lake has and all the tragic events that have happened over the years, they actually changed their name to Forest Green. <laughs> Lame. Tommy heads over there and he tries to warn everyone that Jason's still alive, but because of his mental health issues and his past, the police refuse to listen to him and no one believes him. The only person that believes him is actually Megan, who's the sheriff's daughter. So she decides to head out with him on the quest to find Jason and bring him down once and for all. So Jason's murder rampage arrives back home to the place called Camp Forest Green now, and he sees that children have arrived already for the summer, which is a first in the franchise. It's the first time we actually get to see Jason show up at Camp Crystal Lake and see, holy fuck, there's actually kids here now. What do I do? (laughs) Jason, don't kill kids! But he does scare the shit out of them. And while he's frightening them, this actually gave Tommy an opportunity to lure Jason into the water. Once he's there, Jason gets wrapped in chains by Tommy and drowns once again at the bottom of what used to be known as Camp Crystal Lake. And I don't believe horror audiences were sure and set on the fact that Jason was dead at this because the guy got an axe to it into his head and then was reanimated through a lightning bolt going through a metal spike. What the fuck else is next? <laughs> Let me tell you what's next. It's part seven. <laughs> and this is where shit gets really weird. <laughs> this, this is where the franchise starts to take a turn just into the realm of fucking weird, okay? And this entry was actually one that they were trying to get nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine that? Friday the 13th nominated for an Oscar award, an Academy Award, any Friday the 13th movie, man, that would be the day. But even though it wasn't nominated, the movie still reached success somehow and spawned more entries in the franchise. Even though it didn't hit well for fans, it still somehow reached some sort of success. This entry shows us Tina Shepard, who has telekinetic powers and accidentally murders her abusive father by drowning him in Crystal Lake. Trust me, it gets more ridiculous. It it gets more ridiculous. She suffers from the trauma because she drowned her father in Crystal Lake, and then her and her mother are pressured by her therapist, Dr. Cruz, to return to Crystal Lake and confront her past. The thing is, 
Dr. Cruz actually has an ulterior motive. The doctor wants to trigger Tina's powers to her full scope so they can understand how the telekinetic powers she has works. So she heads to the same place where her father drowned and then falls into a fit of grief when she senses a presence nearby. She believes that presence to be her father, but it's actually Jason Voorhees. (laughs) Go figure. So she sends out this burst of energy to the presence. And that's what reanimates Jason, who's able to break free from the chains that Tommy Jarvis placed him in. So this sends Jason on his on his trademark nerd, murderous rampage and leaves Tina and Nick alive for the end where an epic showdown between Jason and Tina takes place. This is where we get Jason versus Carrie. <laughs> I'm telling you, this movie is Jason versus Carrie, especially at this moment, because Tina's powers are on full display. And then she unmasks Jason, which reveals the gruesome impact being on her wa- underwater for all those years can do to a face and then gets chained to the floor once again by Tina and the ghost of her father. So Tina gets help from the ghost of her abusive father, who she drowned in Crystal Lake with her telekinetic powers to chain Jason Voorhees at the bottom of Crystal Lake. How ridiculous is this? How the fucking ridiculous is this? What kind of fucking ending is that? My God. And you would think that's the worst. You would think that's where it ends, but it doesn't. We're going to head into Friday the 13th, part eight. Which wasn't as bad, okay? It wasn't as weird as other entries in the franchise. It just was one entry that really didn't reach its full potential. And that's due to budget restraints. This movie could have been one of the best Friday the 13th movies ever. Period. Because the concept is Jason going to Manhattan. Could you imagine him walking the streets of Manhattan just swinging his machete around fucking slaughtering people on the sidewalk? Man, that would be terrifying. That would probably be a Friday the 13th movie that actually scared me. And I would have loved to have seen that. But unfortunately, budget restraints didn't really give us much of Jason in Manhattan, despite Manhattan being the kind of gimmick behind the movie. What we get to see is a cruise ship of graduating seniors from Crystal Lake going to New York on a class trip. And then in typical Friday the 13th fashion, because we seem to to like thunder for some reason and electrical currents, a boat who gets its anchor crossed with wires zaps Jason's chains, which brings him back to life once again. So he hops aboard this cruise ship and starts killing everyone in sight. And the funny thing is, is that no one on board suspects that Jason Voorhees is actually the killer targeting these people, except for some drunk guy who nobody listens to anyways. And I kind of feel like that he was trying to be reminiscent of Ralph. Like they were trying to make that character a fan favorite like Ralph was, but it obviously, it can't reach the the depths of character that Ralph gave us. Now it's not until Jason reveals himself to those who are still alive on the ship that they actually head off on an emergency raft towards the shore like they had to see jason and oh my god their shit's going down let's leave no you see a dead body get the fuck off the boat i don't give a shit people are dying i'm getting the fuck out (laughs) so once we're in manhattan for the little bit that we're in in the movie the teenagers don't believe they're being followed by jason anymore They're put into dangerous situations where one of them ends up getting injected with heroin and Jason saves them, weirdly enough. And we find out there's a connection between one of these survivors and Jason from when she was a child. She had almost drowned and was convinced Jason was the one who pulled her underwater. Probably. (laughs) If you drowned in fucking Crystal Lake and someone pulled you under, I bet you any money it was Jason fucking Voorhees. (laughs) Like, come on. How original. So the end of the movie flushes Jason in toxic goo back towards Crystal Lake. As if toxic goo is going to keep him down in Crystal Lake. Motherfucker was had an axe in his head. He was tied down in chains. Fucking electrocuted. And he's not dead. I'm sorry, but toxic goo ain't gonna do shit. (laughs) <laughs> like toxic goo ain't going to do shit to Jason Voorhees and audiences knew that fans knew that. And that's when we get the next entry in the franchise part nine, where everybody did wish that he 
had died in that toxic goo because this one was just fucking weird this one was fucking stupid this this entry in the franchise is just beyond ridiculous okay what we get is the fbi involved because now jason's a fucking country united states wide serial killer at this point the fbi gets involved and ends up killing him for good they head to crystal lake and they kill jason for good at the beginning of the movie he's done he's dead then the medical examiner thinks it's a good idea for some reason to take a bite out of jason's heart while it's still beating um they, so he takes a bite out of jason's heart in what right mind does somebody take the heart out of a dead body or a body that's injured and just bite into it what, who are you hannibal fucking lecter so when this happens jason becomes a spirit that takes over bodies using a fetus-like creature to infect his victims it's like linda blair meets fucking poltergeist meets fucking jason like what the fuck like i know there's been a supernatural element that's always lingered in the friday the 13th franchise like the fact jason never dies that's kind of a supernatural element too but this one pushed it out of the realm of possibility this one pushed it in, into like what the fuck territory okay but that's not even the best part <laughs> that's not even the weirdest part of this fucking movie we then find out that there's only one way Jason can truly die, which is if someone from his bloodline kills him with a special dagger. So it's not enough <laughs> that someone from his bloodline needs to kill the, needs to kill him, but it has to be done with a special dagger. What the fuck? <laughs> How stupid is this shit? So we get to meet Jason's half-niece Jessica because they have to introduce someone in his fucking bloodline for this to make any lick of sense. And then we find out that it's her infant baby who's the spirit that Jason's trying to possess. So not only did we need the family member to make the bloodline connection make fucking sense, there had to be a reason for Jason to want to fuck with this family member to have a chance to die. Like... How convoluted of a fucked up story is that? Just bad. So Jason and Jessica end up having a fucking brawl and Jace Jessica attacks him with the special blade. When she stabs him, it releases the souls of Jason's victims. So all of his souls are now out of purgatory and can be, you know, released into whatever the fuck world they're going to now. There was only one good thing about this movie, and that was the very end. It was literally the only good thing about this movie was the fact that when we see Jason's mask and what remains of him on the ground, Freddy Krueger comes up from hell and drags Jason's remains down to it. That was really cool because that was the tease of Freddy versus Jason, right? It was at that point that audiences are like, holy fuck, are we actually going to get a Freddy and Jason movie? Like, what the actual fuck? But we didn't right away. We did get it eventually, right? We know that we got Freddy versus Jason. We're going to get to that. But there's still another movie in the franchise, unfortunately, that came before Freddy versus Jason. Which, despite the fact we just went over nine, right? We just went over how fucking ridiculous Jason was in the ninth entry. We just, we just went over how fucked up that was. But that's not even the worst entry in the franchise! <laughs> We are going to head now into Jason X, which I know everybody can agree with me is the most absurdly ridiculous horror movie, let alone entry in the Friday the 13th franchise, but the most absurdly ridiculous horror movie, even past B movie status. It's just fucking stupid. And was I, I definitely guarantee it was made because Cunningham didn't want to lose the rights. <laughs> he was losing. He was due to lose the rights for the Friday the 13th franchise. If he didn't make another entry, Freddy versus Jason wasn't happening anytime soon. So he did Jason X because something had to be fucking done so he could keep the rights to the franchise. But give us something, not this. Jason X, otherwise known as what I call it, Space Jason, is by far the corniest and most absurd entry in the Friday the 13th franchise. By far. So what we see is Jason Voorhees, far into the future and in outer space, where Earth has been ravaged by climate change, war, and overpopulation. So scientists from Earth 2, because you can't be creative, it's Earth 1 and Earth 2, what is this, fucking DC Comics? So scientists are on a field trip to take samples when they find Jason cryogenically frozen in the Crystal Lake Research Facility. I have questions. <laughs> I have so many fucking questions. For one, why is Jason Voorhees cryogenically frozen? 
who in their right fucking mind thought it would be a great idea to preserve this fucking killer so that he can be reanimated decades later? Like, that's got to be some sick fucking twisted human being that was like, hey, let's fuck with these guys like hundreds of years in the future. They won't know who the fuck this, th- what this thing is. So let's just freeze them. <laughs> so when they cryogenically unfreeze them or whatever the fuck they do, they're fucked. Like, is this some practical joke? Is this a bad fucking joke? So these people, they bring Jason's body back on their ship and Jason begins to thaw, obviously, which from there, (laughs) we know what's going to happen. And the story, though, it basically becomes Alien and Terminator with a Jason Voorhees skin. (laughs) Like, it's just fucking stupid. He goes and kills androids and humans. It's just it's a fucking shit show of a mess. Okay, Jason ends up getting badly injured, is almost killed and goes on a fucking pod to arrive at Earth 2. And guess what's at Earth 2? (gasps) Camp Crystal Lake. There's a fucking Camp Crystal Lake on Earth 2. Go fucking figure. And that's where Jason lands. <laughs> Go figure. How fucking corny is that? Predictable. So we see Jason in the shuttle pod crash into the lake as two kids go to see what fell from the sky. An absolute sheer shit show of a movie. I know fans everywhere hated this, but it was reprieved because eventually, eventually we got an iconic crossover movie. We got Freddy vs. Jason, which was a great mashup movie. I see so much hate for this movie online and I don't understand why. Like, yes, the story was corny. Yes, the story was borderline B-movie territory. But it's Freddy vs. Jason. Who the fuck is going to watch Freddy vs. Jason for the story and the plot? And the character development. Who gives a shit? (laughs) You're watching the movie for Freddy and for Jason. And they delivered both and executed both perfectly. Perfectly. So that's what makes it a great slasher movie. And it makes it a great movie in both the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise and the Friday the 13th franchise. I don't care what anybody says. I will die on the hill that Freddy vs. Jason was a great fucking movie. It's a lot of fun, too, because the plot itself really wasn't that bad. Freddy not being able to enter dreams anymore because people forgot about him. So then he decides to head on over to hell, dress up as Pamela Voorhees, (laughs) and trick Jason into waking up and terrorizing new victims in Springwood. Like, come on! (laughs) That's fucking awesome. And also that Freddy can unleash his reign of terror because once these people start dying, people are going to believe it's Freddy Krueger who's doing the murders. They'll remember Freddy and then he can come back and unleash his reign of terror. But the thing is, Freddy's plan doesn't go to plan because he doesn't, he underestimates Jason and his own bloodlust for killing victims. If Jason kills them while they're awake or before Freddy has a chance to do so in their dreams, it's all for naught. So you get to see the two of them fighting not only for kills, but then end up fighting each other. (laughs) Like, the teenagers who they're all trying to kill end up pulling Freddy out of their dreams and into reality, so we actually get an iconic fight scene between Freddy and Jason. Like, how fucking cool is that? And both characters were true to form in this fight. It was just iconically epic. And we even got a tease at the end of the movie, when Freddy gets his head decapitated, he winks into the camera. So we may see these two iconic killers back in a film. Who knows, right? But we know for now, we're not going to. (laughs) There hasn't been another entry in the Freddy vs. Jason series, as we'll call it. But there was an attempt to reboot the franchise of Friday the 13th, which some people enjoy. I do see some people talk about how it was a good movie and it was enjoyable online. I do see that. But it wasn't a good movie. It wasn't a good reboot. They took inspiration from the first few entries of the series and mishmashed it into something that just wasn't cohesive. In this version of the movie, we actually see Jason witness the decapitation of his mother during the murder spree of the first movie. And then he builds a shrine for her in the woods at Crystal Lake and decades later begins stalking and killing teenagers who trespassed on Camp Crystal Lake. So it makes sense there, kind of. But like the way the story unfolds, just doesn't feel like a Friday the 13th movie because then Jason ends up kidnapping Whitney because she resembles his mother and keeps her prisoner. So the story then fast forwards weeks in the future and we see Whitney's brother Clay go on a search to find her while Jason's continuing to claim more victims at Crystal Lake. Clay eventually falls under Jason's attack and then frees his sister so that they can unite to kill Jason. 
Jason's body's then dumped into the lake and Whitney's grabbed into the lake by Jason at the last second. So there's a lot of elements from the first few movies mishmashed into one reboot to try and make horror fans clamor and be like, oh my God, fan service. Oh my God, this is so great. It was crap. It was terrible. It didn't add anything new to the series. It didn't inspire anyone to really want to see more entries in the franchise after that. It didn't do what the franchise needed it to do. And then it went into full-on legal battle mode and we haven't had an entry in the franchise since. And it's an absolute shame that we haven't gotten another entry in over a decade. But hopefully, now that the rights are secured to Miller, we'll see something in the near future. So that wraps us up for our special Friday the 13th edition episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I'm so glad to release this on Friday the 13th, the only one that we get here in 2022. So I hope you're experiencing it with a whole bunch of horror movies and maybe some from this iconic franchise. I would love for you to come message us and talk to us more on our social media channels. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram, Cabin of Horrors podcast. I absolutely love hearing from my followers and what their favorite aspects of the horror genre are, what their favorite horror movies are and we have tons of polls and questions that we ask feedback from our audience on so we can have tons of fun together come follow us on facebook and instagram and also visit our website for tons more horror content cabinofhorrors.com we've got tons of different horror articles movie reviews news podcast episodes and a brand new online store where there's tons of artwork right now we've got a halloween poster up there's a sweeney todd poster up and my favorite art piece that i've designed to date a firefly family wanted poster inspired by the house of a thousand corpses movie so go over to cabinofhorrors.com take a look at everything that's there and we have to offer there's going to be so much more coming next week on episode six of the podcast we're going to be diving deep into stephen king's it we're going to be talking about the iconic movie Movie with Tim Curry from back in the day and we're also going to touch on the remake that was done in the late 2010s which I'm not excited about because I don't like it and you're going to hear a heated discussion about it so make sure you're tuning in next week for episode six give us give me a follow a subscribe whatever platform you're listening on and I can't wait to talk to you guys more next week have a freaky Friday the 13th